Hi everyone, very excited to be here at Blue Dot. So, woo! So, today I'm going to talk to you about an aspect of my research as a space archaeologist. What I'm going to ask you to do is imagine that we in this tent are all members of an archaeological survey mission that is taking place sometime in the future. So it could be 50 years, it could be 100 years, maybe it's 500 years. The time isn't really important. But we're approaching our solar system, the one that we live in, from the outside. We have no idea what we're going to find in this solar system. So this is what it looks like. We're actually on the other side of the Oort cloud, which is a, a massive cloud of, of icy comedy bodies uh, around all of the planets and dwarf planets in the solar system. We're heading inwards towards the sun. We have a whole bunch of instruments and sensors on our survey ship, so we can detect uh, concentrations of metals, we can detect different textures, patterns, surfaces. We're interested in finding any evidence there, that there is some kind of technological society or some kind of sentient creatures who are making things. This is our interest. So we're going to head straight through the center of the solar to the center of the solar system, scanning as we go to see if we can find this kind of evidence. So we've moved through the Oort cloud. We're getting close to the area where the solar wind meets the interstellar medium. And as we're approaching this area, our sensors start pinging. We actually find a manufactured object. It looks like this. It's about 800 kilograms, which is the size of an adult giraffe. It has a little octagonal body, a dish, it's got a long boom, and it's dragging some plutonium-238 behind it as well. It's interesting, it's going away from the sun at the middle of the solar system. It seems to be fleeing. What is it fleeing? Some kind of complete catastrophe in the inner solar system? We don't know. We've got too little information at this point to draw any conclusions. We do a full scan of this object and we keep on moving forward. At this point though, we um, decide to have a little peer towards the sun that we're approaching. And along the way, we see this little dot that you can see in the center of the image. We all know what this, this image is. It's one of the most famous pictures ever taken in space. When Carl Sagan asked that Voyager 1 turn its camera back towards the Earth in 1991. We don't know this is Earth, but this is what it looks like. That little tiny speck in the middle of that circle is actually the pale blue dot of Earth. We keep on going. Suddenly, our senses start binging again. We've found a second artifact. This time it's in the region that we know as the Kuiper Belt, filled with lots of icy bodies, with lots of the, the origin we think of, a lot of short-term comets. So this object is similar to the first one that we found. It has a dish. It has radioactive power sources. It's covered in this gold thermal blanket, though, which is a little bit different, and it doesn't have any of those long booms. It's also leaving. It's fleeing whatever it has left behind in the solar system. Again, we do a full scan of this object. We're, we're going to do some further study on this later on. The two things we've seen are fairly similar to each other, but they're also quite different. So we don't know what to make of this yet, but it's early days. Now, we're inside the heliopause, we're in the whole bubble created by the influence of the sun, and we hit our first planet. This is Pluto. It's got five moons, one of them is very large, almost half the size of the planet itself. It's got a kind of a reddish color. We do a full scan around it and its moons, but there's nothing there. So the two spacecraft we found already clearly did not come 
from this planet. It's very dark and very cold as well, maybe not that promising for sentient life. But we do detect a little tiny thread of odd little molecules might suggest that the two spacecraft somehow passed this way as they were leaving the solar system. Nothing interesting here. The survey continues. The next planet we encounter is this one. This, this is a, a cold blue planet which actually has quite an interesting ring system. We have a look at its moons. I think there are about 14 here. We don't find anything. There's nothing going on here in this, this icy giant. But we are getting closer to the sun. We're hopeful that we might find some kind of evidence soon. The next port of call, another ice giant, another one with a lovely ring system. It's got 27 moons. We're just as interested in the moons as we are the planets. And in fact, in this case, pro probably more, because these ice giants tend not to have solid surfaces very close to the outside, and the moons may be a little bit more promising. But as with the others, we find absolutely nothing here. Now, we see a planet that has a very well-developed set of rings, and for just a millisecond, we wonder if they're a feat of planetary engineering. But as we get close to this planet, it's pretty clear that these are composed of, you know, what you would expect. We have a look around the planet and the rings. Perhaps in this spectacular structure, we're going to find some evidence that somebody was living or visiting, but there's absolutely nothing. We find nothing at all. But on its largest moon, we start to pick up some readings again. So we hone in on this moon, and we find something very interesting. We find the first material trace on a solid surface. As we'd expect, it looks quite different to the two spacecraft that were fleeing the solar system. So this one's like a little shell. It's sitting on the surface. It's got some little antennas and instruments, but we can't get inside. We can't really see what's inside it. It's not in bad condition. It seems to be made mostly of aluminium, and there's a lot of methane on this moon, and the two don't react together. There is a lot of ice, though, and we find some little ragged bits of string that might once have attached to some kind of error-breaking system. So this is really interesting. It's not alive, though. It's not moving. We're not getting any signals from it. So it's clear we'll have to keep going if we want to find where this material culture is coming from. The next thing we find as we continue our survey of the solar system is the remains of what was once a much larger comet. We see a picture of it here, but it's likely by this stage that it's in two separate halves. But it's got not just one, but two spacecraft on the surface. One is intact, and we can see that it has panels on it that look like their intention was to collect solar energy. The second one is broken into pieces. Both of them are pitted and abraded because they've been sitting on this little comet going around the sun with all of the, the, the dusts of the comet streaming away in its six-year cycle and all of the dust that moves around gradually abrading those surfaces. So they're quite tarnished and dim, and clearly one was intentionally landed and the other one was crash-landed. We don't know whether that was intentional or not. They're quite different to the other spacecraft we've seen. So as before, we fully scan them and we continue on our survey. The next place we encounter is a gas giant planet not so much ring action going on here, but there's a lot of moons, like a lot of moons. There's at least 69 that are in orbit around it. But disappointingly, we don't find any traces of any kind of non-natural activity here at all. So, a little bit further, a little bit deeper in to the center of this solar system, and we come to a region which is filled, again, with rocky and icy bodies. 
There's a few quite large objects in this region. One of them is a, a very small planet. And interestingly, we weren't really expecting this, but we find the highest density of artifacts of material yet. So there's a little tiny cylinder about this big with little blue solar panels that's whizzing around with all of the other uh, bits of broken rock and fragments that are in this, this, this region. On one asteroid, we find a veritable zoo. There's an orbiter, there's um, at least six little surface objects. Disappointingly, again, they're all silent, so none of them are transmitting anything, none of them are moving. It looks like it's been quite some time since they sent any data to anyone. In, out of all of the interesting things in this particular region, there's, there's one that intrigues us, so we stop to have a little bit of a closer look at it. Because it looks a little bit to us like the two spacecraft that we found abandoned on the comet a little bit earlier. So this is what it looks like. The name we know this object by is the asteroid Eros 433. And this little object that you see sitting on the surface is called Near Shoemaker. So this was a scientific probe, it seems to us. It's got a number of little instruments in it that can be used to measure different things. It's got four solar panels. This is different to some of the others we've seen in which, in which their bodies are solar paneled. It's similar, however, to one of the broken ones on the comet. And it's clear that this one came down gently. It was intended not to crash. It was intended to just touch down on the surface and presumably start sending its data back. We've got a sense in this region of this solar system that we're starting to get close to something. We've had the stuff that's been fleeing, we've had this big distance in the middle where there's hardly anything at all. But the amount of stuff here suggests to us that maybe we're getting closer to the source of the objects that we're finding. But, then something really curious comes up. So we're, we're a ship full of very experienced uh, intergalactic archaeologists, you might say. We've seen a lot of stuff in space. But this one really is a little bit puzzling. So this is maybe what it once looked like. Doesn't look like this now. There are some little fragments of pigment that suggest maybe its main color was red. There seems to be some kind of metal frame, and there seems once to have been a lot of carbon fiber and carbon compounds that were used here. They've all deteriorated, because whoever sent this into space did not harden it against radiation or any of the other factors of the space environment. They went to the effort to put it into orbit around the sun, but they didn't go to any effort to actually protect it, so it's very heavily deteriorated. But we notice how different it is to the other spacecraft that we've seen. So it appears to have missing elements. Some of them look like they might be some kind of circular thing, some kind of wheel. What do you need a wheel for if you're in orbit? Did it miss the planet it was intended to see? But if, if it was intended to be in orbit, why didn't they harden it? If it was intended to land on a planet, why didn't it? Where's the rest of the apparatus that was going to protect it on the descent? Why is it just out there completely exposed? So many questions. We do a full scan. We do take a few samples of this one as well, because we're just so intrigued by this object. So we keep going on our survey. We've left these icy and gassy giants behind. We're getting into planets and moons that are more solid and also warmer as they're closer to the sun. So we think there's a likelihood we might find some more interesting things here. On the next planet we encounter, we hit pay dirt. This planet is chockers with stuff. Sadly, though, Nothing is moving on the surface. We don't hear any radio signals. We can't find anything organic. 
But there's things orbiting it. There's things that have crash landed. There's things that, interestingly, have wheels that are not dissimilar to the strange object that was once red that we found a little bit further out. Stuff on the surface, stuff that looks like it moved, stuff that crash landed, soft landed, stuff in orbit. It seems there's probably some kind of relationship between some of the things in orbit and some of the things on the surface. We can see similarities in style and similarities in technology. What's disappointing, though, is that it's clear that despite all of this activity, at some point it came to a halt. All of these objects are heavily eroded by dust. Some of them are covered in deep sand drifts. So we have to do a little bit of subsurface geophysical survey to find out what they are and where they are. But the sense that we're getting closer to something is growing. This has to be the case. The density increases every step we go closer to the sun. We do notice something really interesting on this planet. We only found it by looking in, in a very um, deep cliff that had been protected from the actions of um, all of the winds, but we found just a little tiny bit of something that looked a little bit like this. It's clear that some of the vehicles on the surface of this planet had been intended to move. We don't know where they came from, we don't know how far they got, but we do know that they did, some of them came some distance because these little tiny, tiny bits of track are surviving. Perhaps they once looked a bit like this, but the winds have erased all of the information we can get from that. So we leave this red planet behind. We observe that there is quite a large moon orbiting the next planet in. So we, we make a beeline for that. This one is very interesting. It has no atmosphere. So everything is laid out on the surface. And it's an even busier place than the red planet that we just left, even though it's just a moon of the next planet in. We'd seen these roving vehicles, and we'd seen the evidence of little tiny bits of track on the previous planet, but here we can see everything because there's no atmosphere at all. One of the first things we notice is that there's a multi-component site. It's got a whole bunch of stuff sitting on it, unlike the one we saw on the moon further out where there's just one little thing. On this, on this moon, we have well over 50 places where there's some kind of technological or manufactured art art artifact on the surface. And several of them have very, very clear tracks. So we find this one. We don't see the, initially the vehicle that made the tracks, but eventually, as we, we continue our survey of this, we find, we find the object and where it stopped. And this gives us a really interesting clue, because it looks as if bodies once fitted inside this little vehicle. We'll get back to this in the next couple of sites. But we can see, even though the winds on the red planet have erased all traces of this movement, we can see what those sites might have looked like by looking at this particular moon. So there's a whole bunch of crash landing sites, soft landing sites, and these multi-component sites where there's a clear relationship between a whole range of different artifacts. As we look at these further, it seems clear that one of these is, is not much, but a bit older than the others. It looks like this. So we can see a number of instrument packages. Some of them are, are crazy looking shapes, like the one you see on your right hand side. We can see antennas, we can see different surfaces. Again, they're all dead. We can't hear any signals coming from them. Um, it seems it's been some time since they worked. But this seems to us, this place seems to us like a scientific landscape. There's no evidence, apart from a, a sort of quite a bulky structure on legs, that there was anywhere that any beings could live permanently. There's no kind of infrastructure to support that. But clearly, for a short period of time, 
some creatures set up these experiments on the surface of the moon and then left, leaving us completely in the dark about their purposes and what all of these instruments mean. But there's something at this place and the other ones too that we haven't seen before and this really intrigues us. We find a series of what you could call trace fossils. So they're not the body of a living thing that has been preserved. They're just the evidence of its movement or its activities. So we find large numbers of these little curved things with ridges in them. This is where some kind of organic creature, we think, made contact with the surface and impressed itself into the soil, leaving this pattern. They're superimposed, so, so they give us an indication of elapsed time, where, where one of the marks is on top of the other. We know that one series of activities took place, then followed by another. It seems that there are two individuals who have made this series of tracks. Not clear what their relationship is. So perhaps this is some kind of pair bonded couple. Perhaps this is um, two unrelated people. Perhaps it's an indication of a family relationship. So it's, it's at this point almost impossible to tell, but it's clear that they're on the surface at the same time and they're carrying out similar activities at the same time. And this could be really, really interesting in terms of the social information we can find out from it. There are only six places where we see these little marks. And we note the resemblance of, at, at the slightly later ones, the resemblance of the roving vehicles to the red thing that we saw in solar orbit out near Mars. So there's an interesting little thread of technology that runs through this, these places. The moon is fascinating, but it's time to see what's going on in the planet that it's orbiting. As we get close to this planet, we see more artifacts than we've seen in the entire solar system. So this is where everything happens. This planet is surrounded by a cloud of whole objects and fragments and little tiny dusts, and it's incredibly dense close to the planet. We also see structure, so there's a, quite a dense ring that's at a distance from the surface of the planet. It looks like it was once even more structured, but has been decaying over time. So these are like the rings we saw in the outer solar system, but these ones are artificial. As we do a scan of the, these objects, we detect one that has a very, very, very rough surface. It seems to be orbiting at the, where we find it, it's about um, 600 kilometers above this planet. And it seems to be, as far as we can tell, the oldest object in this huge swarm, in this cloud of junk surrounding the planet. And this is what it looks like. It's a little tiny aluminum sphere. It has little short antennas sticking out from it, and we can see in the little square solar panels on its body what looks like the origin of the solar panels we saw much further out in the solar system on those other spacecraft. So it seems we have some artifact of whatever the early space age was for this planet. But the amount of stuff orbiting it is really concerning. It's traveling at high speed, it's constantly colliding with each other, there's a really high density of little tiny uh, specks, little dusts that have been created by the decay of these objects. We don't want to get too close here. Our spacecraft is very well shielded, but it just doesn't seem worth taking the risk. It looks to us like this planet has created a fairly bad situation for itself. So we've seen all of this material on the other planets and moons of the solar system that was silent, that was dead, it was not talking. In this swarm of stuff, there are some things that are still talking. We do pick up some signals. Some of them are quite fragmentary. 
We also find we have difficulty sending signals down to the surface in, in terms of doing our survey as well. So we send some little probes, little nanoprobes down through this junk to try and get what information we can. It's clear that there are still things living on the surface. When night comes, we can see various parts of the solid surfaces of the planet start to light up. So someone's down there, they just can't get out anymore. When it comes to daytime, we continue our survey, and it's very clear that these are, we might say, cultural rather than natural planetary processes because we find some very strange geometries. We find things that it's highly unlikely would occur in any natural situation on any planet. So we know they're down there, we'd love to talk to them, but the risks of approaching just seem so great. We gather all the data that we can and we decide we're going to finish our survey maybe come back sometime. So we leave the entombed planet behind and move on to the next one. It's also pretty interesting. It's much closer to the sun, has a very, very thick cloud around it. We can't see what's on the surface from the outside. But when we get closer to the surface, we find that there have been uh, clearly several attempts to visit it, probably from the previous planet. We find these tall standing structures that have landed upright on the surface and presumably carried out their mission. They're little orphans left on the surface of this planet. There's not very many of them. It's not like the moon and it's not like the red planet we saw before, but it's clear before the third planet was cut off that they had managed to get into the inner solar system, including the final planet we find close to the sun. There's only two things that we could find evidence of here. Uh, both are craters. One, they seem to have been created decades apart, and one was probably created by the spacecraft that you see in the corner of the screen. So we've ended up with probably two spacecraft, both of which, which crashed. And we can see the fresh edges of the craters, which are very, very different to all of the ones created by bombardment in the early history of the solar system. So a little bit of activity here, but not very much. This is the last big celestial body that we have to investigate before we actually get close to the sun here. And it's our intention to swing around the sun using its gravity to go to exit the solar system. But we also see that there's some objects in orbit around this sun, quite close. One of them looks like this. It's facing the sun with a very, very uh, heavily shielded surface. So clearly its intention was to go to the sun, not like other things we find which have simply ended up in orbit around the sun. This one was meant to go to the sun. It's quite sophisticated. It's also a lot younger than many of the other spacecraft that we've seen in our survey so far. So this is really interesting. It seems that right up to the last, the people who lived or the beings that lived on this third planet were still attempting to carry out scientific activities in the solar system. But something happened. Well, we know what happened. We know they, they failed to get to the other side of a critical balance. They failed to manage the stuff they were putting into orbit before they were unable to leave the planet. So they had to abandon the solar system. The rest of the solar system has become purely archaeological. And with this, with much to ponder, we decide that our survey is over and our survey ship is going to leave. But having come across this maybe sad situation, it's hard not to think about all of the potential places, geological, ecological niches throughout this solar system, throughout the galaxies, Every time we find something living, 
we find far more things that are silent, that have passed from one state to another state. In the words of Gaston Bachelard, writing in 1958, year two of the space age, and besides, for one living shell, how many dead ones there are, and for one inhabited shell, how many are empty. Thank you, that is the end.